welcome to the Data Leadership Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Anthony J. Algman. Data is everywhere in our businesses, and it takes leadership to make the most of it. We bring you the people, stories, and lessons to help you become a data leader. We've partnered with Dataversity to provide listeners with 20% off your first training center purchase with promo code ALGMANDL. Go to dataleadershiptraining.com to learn more. Today on episode 72, we welcome Krishna Subramanian. Krishna has built three successful venture-backed IT businesses and held senior leadership positions at major companies such as Sun Microsystems and Citrix. She has over three decades of industry experience in cloud computing and data management. She is currently the co-founder and COO of Comprise, the leader in analytics-driven data management software. Comprise enables enterprises to address the two biggest problems they face with data, how to manage today's massive data growth, and how to unlock the business value of data. Krishna, welcome to the show. Thank you, Anthony. Great to be here. So like we do with all our first time guests, just please take a few minutes and tell us a little bit more about your career leading up to Comprise and kind of how all of those experiences led you to doing what you do now. Yeah. Um, so I um, started Comprise along with two of my co-founders. Um, the three of us actually met uh, at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign uh, almost 30 years ago. Uh, and um, this is our third company together. Um, and the reason we have started these three companies uh, is because our background is in distributed computing. Uh, and um, there are so many problems uh, with data uh, that ha ha can be solved with a distributed architecture. So all three of our companies have addressed some aspect of data management. Our first two companies were acquired. You know, our second company created virtual desktops in the cloud uh, and by eliminating SAN storage and it was acquired by Citrix. Um, and after, uh, after we got acquired, we were thinking about, you know, what customers might want in this new uh, era of the cloud and many of our customers from our prior two companies uh, came and told us they're literally drowning in unstructured data. Uh, the massive growth of data outside of databases was catching them off guard. And we realized that there really weren't good solutions beyond storage uh, for people to really understand their data and understand how it was growing, why it was growing, uh, and take better action on data. That's what led us to create Comprise. So for benefit of the folks that are not deep in this particular space, I want to get a couple definitions from you. And the first I want to start with is one of these kind of trick data world definitions, because what it is is like two words that seem super familiar and you can kind of infer what the meaning is, but that's not necessarily exactly what the meaning is. And so when you say data management, in the context in which you're working with it, what do you mean by that, first off? Yeah, it's a great question because, uh, you know, data management um, is kind of like cloud. The word may mean many different things to different people. Um, and uh, basically what we mean by data management is can you get a consistent way to look at your data out, regardless of what host it sits on. So it's not a storage-based solution, it's a data-driven solution. So whether your data is in the cloud, whether it's in object storage, whether it's in file storage, whether it's in the edge data center, it shouldn't really matter. How can you just point a solution at all these things and get to know how much data do you have in total? How much of that data is active? How much of that data is cold? Who's using it? How fast is it growing? All these kinds of things that IT really wants to know about data. How do you get a view of that? And then how do you systematically right place data? Because data likes to move. It, it needs to move to the right place so you can run the right compute on it. Um, so data management is a consistent way to analyze, mobilize, and execute functions on data without getting in the way. You know, that's what we call data management. So it, it, it gets me thinking, is, is data management, so you talked a lot about 
how we do what we do with the data and and and, and a lot of the the mechanisms is the strategy behind that is deciding what to do part of data management or is that a separate data strategy component that is a predecessor step to, to data management as, as you yeah. have defined it. Yeah. So, you know, uh, Anthony, I mean, you probably know this, right? Uh, historically, um, data management was treated as many silos. Uh, there was an analytic silo of like, you know, how do you assess what you have? How do you know what you have? Sometimes it wasn't even done through products. It was done through consultants. You know, a consultant might come in, mm -hmm. run an assessment of your footprint and give you a recommendation. Uh, the problem with that is it's kind of like spring cleaning, right? You know, you kind of know you have to do it. Uh, you know, you kind of know what you have to do, but doing the work is very hard. Uh, and if data is piling up continuously, if your data is more than doubling every year, uh, and you're procrastinating and thinking once a year, I'm going to bring a consultant to do an assessment and then they're going to give me a report and then I'm going to go take some action on it. Guess what? You never get around to doing it uh, and it just keeps on piling up, right? Uh, that's the problem companies are facing. So analytics as a separate thing uh, is not really working for them. Uh, data mobility as a, as a piecemeal thing isn't working for them. Because if they just thought about it as, oh, I'll just migrate data to this new storage. Yeah, they do that and then the new storage fills up and then what? Um, you know, if they if think about cloud as, oh, I'll just stick data in the cloud and I'm done, then they're shocked by the bill that they're getting from the cloud vendor every single month because they're paying by hour for what they're using. Mm -hmm. um, and so the problem is that data is continuing to grow and it's relentless. That growth is not stopping. And so any piecemeal approach to this problem just doesn't work. You really need an ongoing systematic way to assess, mobilize, and then use the data wherever it goes without getting locked in. Because the one constant thing is that technology is evolving all the time. Your options are changing all the time. It's a fair point. And it, it it made me smile because I've often said, you know, to to folks that in organizations that are are not the listeners or the audience for data leadership lessons, but are elsewhere in organizations, they have this notion that data stuff is a project. Mm -hmm. Like we have this definition, we do stuff, and then we're done, and hey, everything's fine, and we can move on to other things. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa! The idea of doing data as a project—it's like it's like the idea that the idea of being done with data is like the idea of being done with HR. Like you're just not going to be done, right? And and we'll get we're we're going to get into all these ideas around like the unstructured data and the growth and all of that. That's where we're going to go next. But it gets me thinking. Like sometimes it's okay to just take the term literally. Like data management is a lot like people management. Yeah because it's constantly evolving the what you need to do is constantly changing yes. and it's not a fair it's not really a fair question to say well is data strategy part of it it's really about saying hey what you need on a day-to-day -day basis from that data is probably evolving. It's probably changing frequently. There's always these new ideas of things that we want to get out of our data, new analytics, new reports, new dashboard, whatever. And managing data to be able to drive any of them is an important consideration. So take your strategy, that's fine. That's a good way to get started, I guess. But to your point, like you can't just call in the consultants once a year, get a strategy and be like, hey, everything's gonna be fine now. Yeah. It needs that kind of constant nurturing. So I think you did a great job of kind of painting that picture because that's exactly right. Data management is management of data <laughs> at, at some level. It's not just like, okay, what other things are we gonna pull into this? It's literally just, managing the data so that we can do the things that we want to do, some of which we can identify at the beginning, some of which we can't, but we're going to need them to do them anyway, right? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I think a lot of people, um, mature companies know this, uh, but, uh, you know, sometimes people don't intuitively understand it. Data will outlive, data outlives every storage that it sits on, and data probably outlives most of us in a company. Uh, because the average lifespan of data is 25 years in most organizations. Uh, so data is going to outlive everything else. So you, you do need to manage it all the time. 
Very true. And even with you know defined data life cycles and retention policies and all of that, um, it doesn't necessarily always listen just because you said, here's our data retention policy. Um, sometimes you lose data that you didn't mean to lose. Other times you can't lose data that you're supposed to lose. Like yeah. it's, it's just, just deciding you want it doesn't make it, doesn't make it true. Doesn't make it happen. Yeah. So I want to go into, cause you, like you've obviously specialized in this world of unstructured data and this rampant data growth. And I'll never forget. I went years ago, I went to an agile conference. And at that Agile conference, they're like, well, things are crazy. It's been a wild time. It was like 2014 or something. Like that. It's been a wild time getting here or whatever. And it's also never going to be easier than it is right now. <laughs> that was just, on one hand, you're like, wow, we've come. Oh, man, that's really depressing because now is the easiest it's ever going to be again. And that's certainly going to be true with with data. Mm -hmm. Um so I want to dig into this notion of the the extremely I, I think extreme growth is not overstating it. it yeah. The growth of the data volumes mm. plus and amplified by the complexity of that data, mm. amplified by the fact that much of the data that we are now capturing in our organizations or are trying to use in our organizations has far less structure to it is causing a challenge that is monumental. It is yeah. really significant. And so I want to start at the beginning. When we talk about unstructured data, do you have a good definition of unstructured data that we can latch on to and, and build from there? Yeah, you know, yeah, it's easier to define unstructured data by what it's not than what it is, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so what is, what is unstructured data? It is anything that you cannot uh, put into a database or define in a clear column and row format. Uh, so it doesn't have uh, a single schema around it. So for example, you know, um, every X-ray image, every time you get your gen genome sequenced and their BAM file is generated, or every time uh, you get into your uh, self-driving car and it's generating all this autonomous car data, uh, you know, every time you download a financial statement from your bank, all of those things are unstructured data. Every tweet that you put out, every video, this recording that we're doing here, this is unstructured data, right? Because it has no specific uh, schema. It has a variety of schema. Um, there is no common structure around all these data. And you can't say it's large files, it's small files. It could be hmm. any variety. Uh, and uh, it's piling up in different places. Some of it is piling up in the edge some in a data center, some in the cloud. So that's what we call unstructured data. And 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 I think that takes a pretty wide view of, of unstructured data. Because something like an audio recording obviously has a structure to it in terms of like a file format. And at a container level, there's a structure to the object of a file. But to your point, you don't naturally have a clear transcript of the words that were said or the specific information and certainly not going to fit our kind of rows and columns relational databases that we're accustomed to. So it's going to need something different. And one would imagine that the rich context of something like an episode of the Data Leadership Lessons podcast, which is going to be amazingly informative and useful, but we can't access it using these mechanisms that we are accustomed to with the, the the structure that has that schema imposed or the data that has the schema imposed to create structure. Yeah. So what do we do? We know there's value there, but for some reason we're being blocked yes. from accessing that value and doing something with it. So, so what do you do about that? How do we start to uh, unravel that problem? Yeah. So as you said, uh, Anthony, it's not that it, there's no structure at all. There are some basic information that the data, uh, the file system tells you or the object storage tells you. It's just not enough uh, detail and it's not easy to gather that information. So what Comprise does is we are a data management service, meaning that our customers just come to our cloud uh, location and sign up for the service. They, typically, we sell to enterprises uh, that are managing data across the hybrid cloud. Uh, and the first thing they do with our solution is they point it at all their file storage and their cloud storage. 
silos. So they can point comprise at their NetApp uh, storage, at their Dell EMC storage, at their Windows storage, uh, at their AWS account, at their Azure account, at their Google account. Once you point comprise at all these things, Comprise actually discovers all the different volumes, the file servers, the shares, the directories, the files themselves, the objects, the object hierarchies, the buckets, everything, and it organizes it all for you. It gives you a view of all of that. It creates an index of all the metadata across all of this, um, and it gives you aggregate information. So it tells you, oh, you have 10 petabytes of data. You know. Of this 10 petabytes, three petabytes in a, are in a data center, five petabytes are in this cloud, two petabytes are at this edge. You know, this is how fast your data is growing. And if you did nothing, you're going to end up buying so much more capacity in the next year. Um, this is where you could save money. You know, we could save you 70% of your costs because, you know, 80% of your data is cold it's, and it's being actively managed and you don't have to. So Compress gives you all this kind of stuff that you might bring a consultant in to do, it automatically does it for you by just pointing at all your storage, but it doesn't just give you a bunch of recommendations. You can then set policies and you can say, okay, I wanna take the cold data from my data center and I wanna transparently move it into Amazon Glacier IR uh, and make it still look like a local file to my user. Or I wanna copy this data into this other place. You can set policies like that and comprise and then Comprise actually mobilizes data for you. So it's a closed loop system. It gives analytics, it mobilizes data with Turing migration and replication, and then it can keeps indexing data and gives you a way to search and find data for new applications and users. So functionally, it sounds to me a lot like web crawlers, like where you're, instead of, crawling the web and looking at websites and the structures or whatever you're looking at as three buckets and the folders and the objects that are sitting within them. So I think conceptually I'm following that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you, you, you're, you're talking about these kind of high level slices at aggregate where you can understand some of the dynamics of, you know, size is a, is a good early, um, assessment of, okay, this is how much we're working with, which is going to have a direct correlation to cost in, in the storage uh, mechanisms in the cloud, especially. Um, and then you're able to help create some um, sense of, of where things are and, and, and what pockets of information are. So you're kind of like drilling into more and more nuanced understanding. Do you actually start to interact with the individual files, like perhaps creating a... Um, you know, a natural language or some other um, uh, algorithm driven understanding of what's actually in those files and maybe structuring some of the the knowledge that's in that or or do you, how far do you go, I guess, yeah. in this journey? Is, yeah, it's a great question. So we, um, so the approach that uh, we take is one of search, curate and enrich. And let me explain what I mean by that. So a lot of times, you know, the first problem customers have is, you know, there's billions and billions of files and objects scattered in all these places. And even to do some data science on it, they have to find the data that they're interested in, in analyzing. Because just copying everything to a data lake and running some analytics on it is not feasible. It'll take too long, it's too expensive. And also, like, like you said, if you have an audio file and a video file, you can't process them the same way. They're different formats. You do different analytics on them, right? So the first thing you can do with Comprise is you could say, well, let me find, maybe you wanna search, you know, all the data leadership lessons, audio files, and you're gonna to try to find all the files that had the word cloud in them, because maybe you wanna then tag them as cloud so that anybody interested in the topic of cloud can find them. Let's say that's the exercise you want to go through. You can point Comprise at your local storage, at your YouTube channel, at all your different places. Comprise finds all the all the files, and then you can say, "Hey, search for me all the audio files that we have in these different repositories created by Anthony in this date range or whatever." Comprise will find that subset of data for you, 
And then you could say, look, I know these are all audio files. Comprise, go run this Lambda function, which cracks open audio files and finds these words in those audio files. And then those results, when the words are there, tag them with these tags. So you could just write, you could just execute that policy in Comprise. Comprise, you don't have to worry that you have to copy that data to a bucket. You have to run this audio um, processing on it. Then what do you do with the output? How do you tag it? Comprise will do all that for you. And you can go back in Comprise and now search for anything that Anthony generated that had the word cloud in it. And now you'll get those results. So we mm -hmm. provide a systematic way to search, curate, execute, and enrich the data. So then the benefit, so like using your example with the audio files and, and creating a Lambda function, my guess is that you can manage the process flow of yes. pretty much anything. And it probably doesn't have to be Lambda. It could be a bunch of different things. Yes. But you're probably not writing that particular Lambda function that is going to go in and search for that, you know, Anthony said cloud or a guest said cloud or understanding yes. that like that's a separate bit of functionality that is going to be not necessarily more difficult, but highly customized to what a particular use case is. I that's correct, know. Anthony. You know, there's a lot of uh, natural language engines, uh, mm -hmm. analytics engines, uh, or, you know, people have even written, you know, maybe JSON scripts or, you know, there's maybe in Apache Spark, you know, you've written in a Parquet uh, file to do some analytics. And so um, we don't have to be the expert in every industry or every field because that's not the problem that we can solve best. That's the problem somebody who knows the domain really well can solve. Many times it may be a customer's own, uh, you know, logic that they wrote. The problem is not that 80% of the problem in data science is getting the right data to that analytics engine and then consistently getting the output of it back so that it can be reused again. Because if I executed a function inside a data lake and I put tags specific to that bucket in that lake, tomorrow I go to another cloud, those tags don't port over. Now what do I do, mm. right? Uh, it, the the real problem is the problem of silos, mobility, consistent visibility, and execution. That's the problem we're solving. Not that the other problems aren't difficult, but you have a lot of best of breed solutions for those. And our job is to bring the right best of breed solution to it in a in a systematic way. Well, and and I'm going to use the same example to make sure I'm thinking of the value proposition appropriately, because like, if I think about, we'll use, actually use my, my podcast as an example, my podcast has to simplify a little bit, one folder on my computer that has all the episodes that I've done, like all the mastered MP3 and MP4 video files that I have. Right. So finding them, not hard. No, they're all the podcast and you could help me. Sure. You could help me go in and tag them all appropriately by executing this Lambda function that I would get written separately or would, would tap into a library separately. That that's fine. Um, it would do that conceptually. That doesn't sound that hard. Like that that's fine because I have one folder of the podcast and all of that, but where I think there's some real power here is because the real use cases, when you're working with enterprises, you're working with businesses, they don't just have one folder of the all of what they do is in this one folder, which in the case of data leadership lessons happens to be the case. But in those circumstances, now you're talking about hundreds, thousands of folders, locations, different things. And what you're doing is you're actually creating a homogenous structure in some ways, by, because yes. once I have those files that are tagged with cloud that are podcasts, and we know from the other metadata that these are audio files, well, now I can start looking across that entire landscape using Comprise to understand, I wanna know any kind of file that's tagged with cloud. Where have they discussed cloud in anything? They yeah. probably do that. Yeah. Let me see all the audio files that have whatever term or only audio files that don't have cloud because I want to understand what they were talking about because we don't even know what were in those episodes if we weren't talking about cloud. Like being able to create a search across all of these yes. 
gets really interesting because you compare that to a relational database. If we're thinking about database dynamics and all of that, well, yeah, it's easy when you have a table and you can query things, but how could you ever query with one simple statement, 70 different table structures that's all at one time? That, that's what you're doing. And I think that's really interesting because once you get it tagged, now you can tap in and say, okay, I can help you find whatever you're looking for. And the beauty is you don't even need to know what your folder structure is, which in my example, the one thing that I kind of left out was that where I have all of those podcast episodes, I've changed like three times and I don't even remember where it is now half the time. So I have to go hunting around or whatever. You could have solved that part of the problem for me too, but yeah. it probably is an overkill uh, so, uh, overkill solution for me just having a more consistent folder structure that I really need to implement. Yeah. But, and is that, so am I on the right track of where the, the yes. core value proposition of Comprise is? Yeah. Yes, yes, you're absolutely on the right track. Most of our customers uh, are petabytes and petabytes of data. You know, and typically customers start using us when they have at least 250 terabytes of data. And as you said, it's not one person that created all this data inside one account in one bucket in one folder. They can just do a listing and find it. It's many people, it's, you know, it's hundreds of, of uh, uh, buckets, thousands of folders, you know, may, uh, strewn across different vendors. You can just see how this complexity grows, right? For example, one of our customers is Pfizer. And, you know, every day Pfizer scientists generate at least 10 terabytes of data. Uh, so 10 terabytes of data is like 2 billion photos. I mean, imagine, if every day you add 2 billion photos uh, and now you have to search across all of this, that's the scale of the yeah. problem. Yeah, you captured it very well. So it's clear that this plays at the very large scale, enterprise scale, organizations like Pfizer and, and other kind of Fortune 500, Fortune 100 kinds of companies. I imagine, though, that the complexity that we're now seeing in the midsize and even smaller businesses is probably substantial enough to warrant this kind of solution as well. Do you, you do you market to those um, kind of smaller organizations as well, or are you playing squarely in the enterprise space? No, you know, we, we sell to any data intensive uh, customer. So I can tell you that uh, a lot of our customers are, you know, state and local, you know, police departments mm -hmm. and, you know, county governments. And the reason they like the product is because if you think about a police department, they have so much body cam, dash cam video, then most of them have digitized all their forensics records. And you think about the volume of forensics data that they have, uh, you know, again, so many cases, so many files, imagine being able to search across all of them easily and finding legacy information that might be useful to your new case very simply, uh, and, and also reduce the storage cost of storing all of that data, right? So um, so though that's an example of more of a mid-size uh, you know, uh, organization that benefits from our solution. Uh, research institutes, you know, we have a lot of uh, educational institutions um, like Yale University, Northwestern University, Stanford University that are our customers because you know, you think about all the research data that they are generating and how can they manage that efficiently? So. It's it's scary how much data we're creating. I was, yeah. Like, I mean, even businesses that aren't, you know, that big, you think once you start thinking about video, you know, I mean, I remember when I was a chief data officer, officer at the Chicago Transit Authority, I was, I we had hundreds of video feeds that were capturing and recording information that we needed to retain for a certain period of time because you never knew when there would be a crime or a search for a person or some sort of thing that we needed to go back to and, and find. And, and like, that was a really simple use case. And that's several years ago. I just think like even smaller independent restaurants or retail locations or whatever, if you've got video feeds, security feeds, like, all of a sudden you're working in some bigger data than you ever really planned on. And it's meaningful. It's important to your business. And so you need to manage that in an appropriate way. I am curious because this kind of thing, and, I, and this is a question I like to ask depending on, on the nature of the guest's business. Um, 
who buys this in an organization? Like, who do you market your solution to? It's obviously a pretty technology specific type of, of thing, but it's also where, like, I think about the typical, like technology organizational structure. And I'm like, wow, I don't know who, who latches onto this and leads that kind of charge for bringing this into an organization. Where do you find that is, is most relevant, most successful as you, you know, grow your business? Yeah. So, you know, we're, what we're finding um, um, is that in a lot of companies, uh, you know, uh, what used to be the storage or the IT infrastructure organization is going through a transformation. Um, and they're becoming more of a service provider internally to their different mm -hmm. departments. Uh, so often they're becoming a data services team. Um, or a cloud data services team. Uh, so they're not only in charge of the infrastructure, but they're in charge of providing a certain SLA to their different business units. Mm -hmm. uh, and, mm -hmm. it, you know, and they're trying to also provide value um, for their uh, businesses. Uh, so that's who we usually go into. So we go to the mm -hmm. VP of, uh, you know, um, of data services or VP of uh, global infrastructure or VP of cloud you know, uh, that's the kind of title uh, that we typically go to. Um, and they're looking at, you know, storage costs growing at 30% plus, you know, every single year. It's a, it's a sizable amount of their overall budget. And they're trying to get a handle on that cost as data keeps growing. And they're trying to provide a better data service to their users. Um, and so they like our solution because of the visibility it provides and the cost optimization it provides. And then the fact that users can just, like you said, it's like Google search on all your data. So users can use it to now find data easily and to use it for new applications. And I'm and I imagine you can start to understand some of the patterns of usage so that you can appropriately store for faster retrieval that information that tends to be used more versus the the data you may need to save yes. um, but don't necessarily need to access as, as quickly you can use a lower cost storage mechanism for that that's exactly right you know uh, so the the interesting thing about data in most of these organizations is that um you know data is hot for some period of time when it really needs great performance and you need to back it up very uh, frequently and protect it uh, at a you know at an expensive uh, price. But eighty percent of data becomes cold within a few months, uh, and it's not really being actively accessed. And at that point, nobody goes and tells IT, "Well, I'm done with this now. Now you go and manage it in a bit better way," because they have moved on. Their users, you know, they want to keep all their data around, but they're doing the next thing. Um, and so it still consumes those expensive resources. It might still be sitting on flash. It might be getting backed up, you know, every few days. It might have a DR copy on it. And it's cold data. You don't have to do that. You can protect it at, you know, 20% of this cost. You can store it at 20% of this cost. And if we can do it transparently, so your user doesn't even know that it moved elsewhere, well, now it's like magic. That's what we do. We transparently tier the data. So it still looks like a local file, even though it's sitting as an object in the cloud. Uh, it's, your backup process didn't change, but we shrank your backup size by 80%. So we saved the cost there by 80%. You can meet your SLAs better because you're backing up less data. Um, and, and you can protect your data better because we protect that data from ransomware, for example, by object locking it. So you get all these benefits by right-sizing the data management to the profile of the data at that time. Unless anyone out there is is under this illusion that data is or that storage for data is cheap and that object storage is cheap, I can assure you that if you're growing at 10 terabytes a day or you have petabytes or more of data, it's not cheap. It's not cheap in aggregate, especially when you're growing quickly and dealing with things like video feeds and all that. It, it adds up much yes. quicker than you might realize. And so managing costs for storage are is it's, it's important stuff at, at this mm -hmm. kind of scale. And I think this kind of scale 
being relative, certainly, but is becoming more relevant for even small and mid-sized businesses. I think there's a lot of businesses out there that never really thought of themselves as, as being data businesses or data-driven businesses, all of a sudden finding themselves with opportunities or um, you know, a, a necessity to be competitive to do uh, data-driven behavior. I've, I've, um, I have a friend who owns a uh, like home remodeling business and his business, which is as, as physical and, and tangible as you can imagine, is incredibly data driven and it's all digitized, has tons of storage, all these contracts, all of these, you know, purchase orders, all of this complexity of bids and all of these things. I'm like a business which is conceptually simple and it sh you know, shouldn't be a data business is absolutely 100 percent a very complex data business that, yeah, that generates a lot. Files, right? CAD files are really large. They're probably mm -hmm. like, if they're digitally kind of uh, rendering any of the remodeling projects, they probably have a lot of data from that as well. Yeah. Absolutely. And so there's one thing that it's been kind of a loose thread in my mind from what we talked about earlier and in, in, in your introduction of Comprise that I want to revisit to make sure I understand is, is you talked about um, is, is your offering a as a service offering? Is it a um, cloud based offering itself? Because I want to understand how do you do that when you have to interrogate so much of what my organization may have either locally or in the cloud or in its own accounts or lockdown or, or whatever. How, how do you do that? If it is, yeah. in fact, if I heard you correctly, that it is a, an as a service offering. Yeah, that's a great question. Yes, we are an as a service offering. Uh, we are what you might think of as a hybrid cloud service in the sense mm -hmm. that our console runs in the cloud. And if you have data in data centers that you want to introspect and move, we have uh, virtual appliances called observers that you just download and run local to, to those data centers uh, so that it's faster, right? So we're analyzing local storage. We're moving the data to the cloud from closer to the data. Uh, so it's a hybrid architecture, but it's managed through the console. So you don't have to, if, if all your data is in the cloud, for example, you don't have to set up anything. Um, but, and only if you have data in data centers, you then use the virtual uh, appliances locally, um, but still there's no hardware or any uh, special infrastructure you need. You just uh, run it as a virtual machine. Great. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. So yes. we're, we're just about out of time. And, and so I want to give you an opportunity. Is there anything that you think is important for the audience to hear about Comprise that we haven't already covered or any other advice you might have for folks out there that are learning today, perhaps that this is something they really should be spending a little bit more time thinking about and, and starting to take action on? Do you have any bits of advice uh, for folks out there that might have found them, themselves in that solution uh, or in that situation uh, uh, listening to this episode? Yeah, I mean, for anybody that is in, uh, you know, IT, in kind of data IT, and if, especially if they're thinking about a move in their career, um, I would say it is an extremely exciting time uh, because, you know, definitely uh, the role of IT is changing to be more of data operations or data services. Um, and, um, you know, with the rise of things like machine learning, uh, the need to analyze unstructured data is just becoming more and more urgent. And you're going to see a lot of innovation on that front. Um, and, you know, um, I, I will say for anybody who might be interested in this, who might have, uh, you know, data of their own, um, you know, if, if you want to play with a product like Comprise, we actually do have, you know, a, a trial and a demo that you can sign up for. Um, and we have things like uh, a Comprise Techno Professionals training that we provide uh, to our customers, to their, to IT teams, because there's an evolution happening in this market. Uh, so there is things like that um, that you can take advantage of to also grow in your career. Um, so that would be my last piece, I think. Well, Krista, thank you for that uh, advice, for that was I This has opened my eyes to a whole new area of um, offering in the data and, and 
kind of storage and, and optimization space. I think it's really interesting, uh, the work that you're doing. And it's, and it's exciting to see your career journey and how you've been able to do different businesses with folks that you've known for so long. And, and I spent a, quite a lot of time at, at um, University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign myself um, uh, in about the same time range. But it, it, it's, it's great to see that kind of consistency and finding new challenges to solve over uh, the course of your career. So I think that's, that's really exciting as well. But Krista, thank you so much for, for being on the show today. I, I really appreciate it. It's been a great episode. Likewise. Thank you for having me, Anthony. And thank you all for joining us today. As always, you'll find more information about our guests and links in the show notes. Go to dataleadershiplessons.com to subscribe and check out past episodes and accelerate your journey with training at dataleadershiptraining.com. Stay safe during these unusual times and go make an impact.